Louise, thank you. That is the BBC News at six for tonight. We will, of course, have much more on all those developments in the Middle East coming up at 10. But uh, right now here on BBC One, let's, of course, get the news wherever you are this evening from our colleagues. Bye-bye for now. Thanks, Jane, and welcome to Look North in the headlines tonight. A double killer who beat his fellow Italian flatmates to death. The police say he was mentally ill and driven by the occult. We found evidence that he was researching voodoo uh, and it was his belief at the time that both Nino and Francesca had put a spell on him. Another big night of Champions League football on Tyneside with Borussia Dortmund fans relishing the trip. We heard a lot about St James Park, about the atmosphere. It's legendary, we heard about it like with the best atmosphere in, in England. A campaign for better safety measures after an alarming number of river drownings across the region. And I'll be live outside St James's Park as Newcastle United look to make it back-to-back -back European wins and take control of their Champions League group. And we'll have all the goals from last night's games as Middlesbrough make it seven wins on the spin. Good evening. A paranoid schizophrenic who attacked and killed a young couple with a sledgehammer in their bedroom because he thought they'd cursed him has been told he may never be released. Andrea Cardinale had shown an interest in the occult and was hearing voices in his head when he burst in on Nino Calabro and Nino's partner Francesca Di Deo in Thornaby on Teesside last year. He admitted a charge of manslaughter with diminished responsibility. Just a warning, you might find some of Peter Harris's report distressing. What they call you, mate? Andrea. Andrea? Yes. The times... He surrendered calmly, but in the hours before his arrest, Andrea Cardinale had unleashed an unspeakable horror. Walking into a young couple's bedroom at Flats, he'd set about them with a sledgehammer. In the grip of severe mental illness and hearing voices, he believed his friend Nino Calabro and Nino's girlfriend Francesca had placed a spell on him. Their last known movements captured on the flat CCTV as Francesca greets her partner on his return from work before Cardinale burst in on them. He fully admitted both the killings. He identified that the reason he did it was because he had voices in his head, voices relating to the victim. Uh, he was under the belief that they'd put um, a spell on him. We've obviously found evidence through internet searches that he was researching voodoo, um, spells, and that he purchased books relating to witchcraft. After the killings, Cardinale changed and headed to a petrol station where he was seen filling a container with diesel with which he doused one of the victim's bodies. It was said he intended to start a fire and die with the victims. Andrea Cardinale's family back home in Italy had been increasingly concerned about his mental state. Indeed, his dad had flown over only to come across the full horror of his son's actions here at the flats. It was the dad who raised the alarm. Nino had been attacked with a sledgehammer in the bedroom. Francesca had been cornered in the basement. Cardinale said it was the voices in his head that told him to do it. From Italy, Francesca's mother said her life is destroyed. Since her death, we could no longer find inner peace or comprehend what happened. We no longer sleep at night because our thoughts are all about our daughter. We are completely exhausted. Our every thought is of our beloved Francesca. The father of her boyfriend, Nino, said, not having Nino with us anymore is not easy to overcome. With the help of our Lord, we have to face the future. After arresting Cardinale, the police found he searched the internet for weapons, gas tanks, acid, dynamite and instructions on bomb making. He planned to blow the flats up on New Year's Eve. He has acute paranoid schizophrenia. Nino had worked as a croupier in Stockton. He'd known the man who killed him for years. Francesca was just visiting from Italy. This is a really tragic case. Uh, of two young people being robbed of the rest of their lives uh, by some senseless killings. 
this must be one of the most tragic situations you've come across, I guess. Yeah, definitely, and certainly in terms of the homicide investigation team who undertook, undertook the investigation, it's affected them significantly. Um, they were brutal killings. Today, a judge told Andrea Cardinale he will be detained in a secure hospital. He may never be released. Peter Harris, BBC Look North. Around 2,000 Borussia Dortmund fans are making their way to St James's Park round about now ahead of their team's Champions League match with Newcastle United, which kicks off at 8 o'clock. Well, the Germans are the latest European visitors to the city. The French team Paris Saint-Germain haven't been well beaten by the Magpies earlier this month. And while businesses are enjoying a boost in trade, the fans are looking forward to another night of top-flight football. Mark Denton reports. <laughs> After the red and blue of PSG, the centre of Newcastle tonight, full of the black and yellow of Dortmund fans as they headed from the big market to St James's Park. Many arrived on a charter flight this morning. They are bottom of the group before tonight's game, but confidence is high. I'm so much looking forward to it. I know it's going to be a hard game, but I, I believe we can do it. They won their last game, Dortmund, but uh, I think it's going to be a tough one. But uh, of course, they're going to be uh, prepared and they're going to win. We're looking forward to it. I mean, we're, we definitely have to win, I'd say, and uh, we will win. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, we are looking forward to the city and uh, to the stadium. It's the first time here. What do you think the score is going to be? Who? I think 3-0 for us. We heard a lot about St. James Park, about the atmosphere. It's legendary. We heard about it like with the best atmosphere in, in England. And we uh, we have to try and, and get some points here. Get them in, get them in. And for two English Dortmund fans, a reunion. Former British soldiers Nick and Mark started supporting the club while serving in Germany. We used to travel together everywhere yeah. when we were in the army. And he left the, when we left the army and now because of Dortmund, now we're linked again together. He comes across two or three times a year, and we've not lost the contact. It's brilliant. Friends forever, as they say. When I came back, I carried on supporting them. I've not watched any English football, really. What do you think the atmosphere is going to be like? I think it'll be uh, electric. However, it'll be just as big when they come back to Dortmund yeah. and they uh, face the yellow wall. 81,000 in Dortmund. Yeah. There's something special, that is. Something special. So you get garden spicy and you Meanwhile, at the German Donner Kebab Company, all those Dortmund fans inspired some smart marketing. So we're giving the first 100 German uh, Dortmund fans who come through the door today a free OG kebab. All we need to do is see um, a German passport, some German ID to show that they're German um, and then that's a free kebab for them. Black and yellow against black and white. Newcastle United's European adventure continues. Mark Denton, BBC Look North, Newcastle. Well, much of the pre-match talk has surrounded the future of Newcastle player Sandro Tonali, signed last summer from AC Milan for £55 million. His involvement in a betting investigation back home in Italy means he's facing a lengthy ban from the game. Well, earlier I spoke to the Italian sports writer Alessandro Schiavoni, who's been following the case. The prosecutor, Giuseppe Chine, wanted 12 months, maybe even 15 months, but his lawyers tried to negotiate it down to 10 months without uh, being able to play, obviously, the, the suspension, and another eight months where he participates in anti-gambling activities, going to schools, going to uh, grassroots football clubs, and where he explains why gambling is bad. I mean, that's part of his ban. And also therapy, I mean, uh, on a weekly basis. But I think 10 months without playing will be um, the outcome when it's official. Any surprises in football, but I think this was a surprise to Newcastle. How much do you think Milan knew of Tonali's problem before they sold him? It was strange that Milan just bit Newcastle's hand off. I mean, first offer rejected, second offer accepted. For an Italian player who loves the club more than anything, who was born a born and bred Milanista, always will be a Milan fan. And whereas for other players, foreign players, the club turned down bigger offers. Some things make a lot, a lot more sense now. And we'll hear the latest on tonight's big match with Alistair Gill live outside St James's Park later in the programme. 
Now, a West Cumbrian man accused of murdering his baby son has admitted repeatedly lying to the police about what happened and about the scale of his drug use. Rhys Kelly, who was giving evidence for a second day at Carlisle Crown Court, denies violently shaking to death his four-month-old son Dallas at their Workington home two years ago. Our reporter Mark McLinden was in court and is in our Cumbrian newsroom. So Mark, just bring us up to date with what Rhys Kelly's had to say. Yes, well, Rhys Kelly was called to the stand by his defence team yesterday, Jeff. You'll remember that on the first day of this trial, he told the court that he would plead guilty to the manslaughter of his baby son, Dallas, but he denies murder because he says he didn't intend to cause the child uh, serious harm. He told the jury yesterday that he decided to admit that he did shake Dallas, but that it was only gently and just for a few seconds because the boy was in distress and wouldn't calm down. And he said today that everyone deserved to know the truth. Now, Dallas died in hospital four days after Rhys Kelly had shaken him. The cause of death was a traumatic head injury. And what else do we hear today, Mark? Well, Rhys Kelly has been giving evidence today under cross-examination from the prosecutor in this case, a man called Richard Little. He told Rhys Kelly that it was clear that he had lied to the police when he, fir when he was first questioned three days after Dallas's death, telling officers he didn't know what had happened. Now, Mr Little put it to Rhys Kelly that you were very violent to Dallas, weren't you? And Mr Kelly replied, no. Mr Little continued to challenge Rhys Kelly, saying that if he'd shaken Dallas for just a few seconds, as he claimed, that he must have increased the force to cause the kind of injuries that Dallas suffered. You gripped and squeezed Dallas so tightly, you fractured five of his ribs, he said. Rhys Kelly replied, I admit it, I only lost control for a second. And what did Rhys Kelly have to say about his use of drugs? Well, Richard Little said Rhys Kelly lied to police about his use of prescription drugs because uh, the police might have thought he wasn't the best carer for a baby boy. Now, we know Rhys Kelly used painkillers that he bought from street dealers to tackle what he said was a chronic uh, stomach problem with unbearable pains he'd had for several years. Uh, Rhys Kelly again admitted today that he could have been a better father, but he denies murdering his son Dallas. The trial continues, Jeff. OK, Mark, thank you. The family of a teenager who drowned in the River Ouse in York is campaigning for increased safety measures to prevent more deaths. Leah Bedford, who was 16, went missing in September. Her body was recovered from the water just over a week later. Well, across our region, there have been 136 drownings in the last eight years. In North Yorkshire, there were 23. In Northumberland, there were 21. And in Cumbria, 42. Nathan Turvey reports. This was the last time Leah was seen alive on CCTV near Lendal Bridge in York City Centre. A body was recovered from the River Ouse eight days later after a big police search for her. Leah was very bubbly, outgoing, loved, um, typical teenager really. Um, liked to be out with the friends, liked music, socialising. Leah's family and friends are now calling for better CCTV and lighting along the city's waterways, which they think would help save lives. An online petition calling for better safety measures has now had more than a thousand signatures. It's just as for Leah, as well as any other parent um, who's lost a child to that river. Um, we're petitioning for more lighting, more CCTV cameras and more fencing, anything that can help the younger generation um, not accidentally go in the river. The footpath along this particular stretch of the river is very close to the water and there's no lighting around here. You can see how on a dark night someone could easily go into the water. The York Water Safety Group, which includes the Fire Service and City of York Council, says a number of safety measures have been put in place, including improved life belts and ladders and the introduction of fencing in particularly dangerous areas. But despite that, the York Rescue Boat says it's been called out almost 40 times this year to people who've gone into the water. It was founded in 2014 after a series of deaths in the city's rivers and has just passed its 300th call-out since then. Better lighting along the, this stretch of the River Ouse would be good. A um, couple of things, it lets people see the edge during the night. It helps other members of the public see if someone's in difficulty along the side of the river. And it also helps emergency responders like ourselves to when we attend and to actually see what's going on. It would definitely help to save lives. Losing the year is a, um, a massive, massive loss to all of us. And she's going to be so sadly missed. Her dad's so overwhelmed with the amount of love and support. 
that we have had for Leah. We'd just like to thank everybody for that. Nathan Turvey, BBC Look North, York. Now, it's just a few days since the death of long-serving Middlesbrough footballer Bill Gates. And today, with poignant timing, a film was released about Bill's life and his journey with dementia. It highlights the disturbing link between dementia and heading of football. It was shown to an invited audience in Stockton to mark the start of the Tees Valley International Film Festival. As Phil Connell reports. The death of Bill Gates, Borough's legendary defender, was announced at the weekend. So for his widow, Judith, the screening of this film, detailing his life and journey with dementia, was a difficult and poignant watch. I will be watching my husband alive, next to me, shoulder to shoulder. What I recognise as I'm watching it is that now I am his voice and I am the person who has to speak on his behalf in order to try and deliver his legacy of protecting players of today and tomorrow. The film launched the start today of the Tees Valley International Film Festival. It examines growing evidence linking brain injuries to heading footballs. In training, Bill is said to have headed the ball around 100 times a day. A way of life, then, from which his family hope lessons can now be learnt. I hope that the legacy of this film is that everyone who ever heads a ball recognises that there's a potential danger. And I'm talking not just at the professional level, I'm talking at the grassroots level. I hope that the legacy of this film is that every mum and dad that plays in their back garden says to their kids, be careful. The film, it's hoped, will help raise the profile of Bill's charity, Head Safe Football, a powerful story which his family hope will now be a catalyst for change. Phil Connell, BBC Look North, Stockton. Plans for a housing development which would see 160 trees removed in South Tyneside is causing upset and anger among those living nearby. Avant Holmes has made a planning application to build 260 houses on the site of South Tyneside College, which has been relocated to South Shields Town Centre. Well, the application said a line of trees, which includes a weeping beach, needs to be removed. But locals say they should be able to do the work around them. Alison Freeman reports. Basically, it's our Sycamore Gap tree. This means the same to us as what Sycamore Gap means to everybody in the North East. So it's just an iconic tree. It's been here longer than the existing buildings. But if plans are given the go-ahead to turn South Tyneside College into a large housing development, this weeping beech tree will be one of 160 that are cut down. We understand some trees will go, but 160 mature trees is just totally unacceptable. So you're not actually against the development as such? No, we see the need for houses. We, we totally get that. We understand that. But they need to be built sympathetically towards the mature trees and nature. This day and age is crazy. Surely they can work around the trees, protect the roots, save the trees. Don't remove trees just so you can get your vehicles in to demolish the college. So far, more than 2,000 people have signed a petition calling for the trees to be saved. In a statement, the developer, Avant Holmes, said it was liaising with the council about the trees and will do so throughout the planning application. South Tyneside Council said people can raise objections as part of that process. But campaigners think more needs to be done. If our council has declared a climate and ecological emergency, that seems like a step back to allow that to go through at the planning committee stage. It's not just a quick fix where all of a sudden you've planted a sapling and you've got back what you've removed because you haven't. The Weeping Beach is 80 years old and the group says it and the other trees on Grosvenor Road still have a lot to offer. It's our local green avenue and it will be of an benefit to the new development rather than something that has to be wiped out and replaced by an immature new sapling. Alison Freeman, BBC Look North, South Shields. Well mention there of the famous tree at Sycamore Gap in Northumberland. It's a month now since it was felled and tomorrow night we'll be marking the occasion with a special report by celebrity chef and hairy biker Cy King. Now, as we've already heard, it's pretty busy in Newcastle tonight. It's the Magpies against Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League. And Alistair Gill is outside St James's Park for us. Alistair. Jeff, two years ago, Newcastle had just sacked Steve Bruce. New head coach Eddie Howe was yet to put pen to paper on a deal. And the team itself was mired in relegation trouble at the foot of the Premier League. The turnaround from that 
to this tonight is nothing short of astonishing. And while we all know that Newcastle United are now one of the richest teams in Europe, many of the players who will walk out on the St James's Park pitch tonight are the same ones who struggled under Bruce at the start of that season. And they're now looking to win back-to-back -back Champions League games, as Andrew Hartley reports. Newcastle's 4-1 demolition of PSG in the Champions League three weeks ago was a win for the ages. The question tonight is, can they do it again? We need to recreate that, that level of intensity and that level of alertness that we were at. I think we're almost in the, for that game, we're in the perfect place mentally. Newcastle midfielder Sandro Tonali trained yesterday and, as it stands, is still available to play tonight. If he does, it will almost certainly be his last game in a black and white shirt this season, with a 10-month ban expected for a breach of betting rules. With him, Newcastle striker Alexandra Izak. He was a Dortmund player before signing for Real Sociedad in 2019. We're a quietly confident group, but we know we've got a lot of good players within the group and um, they were not really scared to play against anyone, especially with, with the manager and the, the plans he puts in place. Meanwhile training with Dortmund, American winger Giovanni Reiner. The 20-year-old was born in Sunderland when dad Claudio Reiner played for the Black Cats. The youngster side are one of the giants of the German game with a huge pedigree in Europe. And Dortmund know the atmosphere at St James's Park tonight will match the occasion. I played here once. It was exceptional as a stage. We have to expect the crowd and atmosphere being prepared. We can expect a warm welcome, so it is a matter of us producing our game and energy on the pitch. Newcastle are top of Group F and a win would put the Magpies on seven points after three matches and represent a major step towards qualification for the knockout stages. This game is a crucial game in, in the group um, because following this game we have two really tough away games so we're, we know the task at hand, we know it's not going to be easy but um, as I say we have to use everything that we have in our armoury to, to try and win the game. The crowd's going to be key, our own performance obviously going to be key. Another tough examination for Newcastle but they've done well so far so there's every reason for the fans to dream of more glory tonight. Andrew Hartley. BBC Look North. Let's turn to last night's football now and Middlesbrough marked one year since new head coach Michael Carrick took over in style last night by winning their sixth championship match in a row to move them just one place outside the playoff places. Sunderland though are going in the wrong direction, three defeats for them in a row now and they're down to ninth. Elsewhere there was a big win for Carlisle United, Harrogate Town lost but we'll start the round up with Borough. Middlesbrough were met by flames at Carrow Road, but it was Borough who extended their hot streak against Norwich. This was a slow burn of a win, Middlesbrough in control, but unable to find the breakthrough until the second half. Josh Coburn setting up Sam Greenwood. Norwich hit the bar and would score a very late consolation, but not before Samuel Silvera sealed the win and fired his side up to seventh. Sunderland's task against runaway leaders Leicester got much harder 12 minutes in when James Justin headed home for the Foxes. Anthony Patterson's saves ensured the Black Cats stayed in the contest and Sunderland perhaps should have had a penalty for this challenge on Dan Neal. But despite Patterson's heroics, his side couldn't find an equaliser and it's now three defeats in three for Tony Mowbray's men. Half an hour into their game with Burton Albion, Carlisle found themselves 1-0 down and in the League One relegation zone. But the Cumbrians flipped the game on its head to win for just the second time in 11 matches. Jordan Gibson found the equaliser for the Blues before Joe Garner scored a dramatic late winner. And a first-half collapse from Harrogate at home to Mansfield in League Two left them 3-0 down at half-time. Levi Sutton scored a late consolation as the Sulphurites lost 4-1. About an hour to kick off here now. A bit of team news for you. Sandra Tonali is on the bench and a couple of changes in the starting lineup with Miguel Almiron and Alexander Isaac coming in for Murphy and Wilson. Jeff. OK, look forward to it. Alistair, thank you very much. And if you're heading down to St James's in the next hour, Paul, will you need a coat? Well, <laughs> it's not that warm and there's some good old-fashioned northeast rain and drizzle there. It's not heavy, but a damp evening, I think, which, who knows, might favour the home team. 
weather pictures for tonight from uh, right around the region, coast to coast in fact. We start off first of all with an unusual view of Souter Lighthouse, bit of muted autumn colours in the foreground there and fairly grey skies overhead in Kathleen's shot. Next we're off to the Cumbrian coast where things were a little bit brighter, a little bit of blue sky breaking through from time to time in Malcolm's shot there uh, from Workington. And uh, in the middle, uh, lovely autumn colours there in Jesmond Dean in Newcastle as seen in Teresa's shot there. Next few days we've got low pressure in charge, that means there will be some showery rain uh, for most of us from time to time. Probably not huge amounts of it in the short term at least, but damp at times. Certainly been damp across many eastern areas today. Cumbria has seen the best of the drier weather. That pattern continues through the evening. The patchy rain and drizzle in the east becoming uh, less widespread, I think, through the evening. And by the end of the night, we'll just notice the first signs of this next area of rain coming up from the southwest. Overnight temperatures down to about 6 or 7 Celsius at their lowest and the winds remain light. So we head into tomorrow morning. It's a grey, misty, murky start for many. This area of rain does start to work its way up from the southwest. It moves across to eastern areas. Showery outbreaks of rain, quite heavy at times along the northeast and the North Yorkshire coast. You can see some bright colours in there as we head through the afternoon. Generally drier and a bit brighter further west. So Cumbria uh, enjoying the lion's share of any brighter weather tomorrow. Afternoon temperatures, they'll reach 12 or 13 Celsius. Again, similar to today. I think you might notice that southeasterly breeze picking up a little bit uh, tomorrow. Now, over the next few days, as I say, low pressure in charge. Big, slow-moving area of low pressure sitting out in the Atlantic to the west of us. Drifts slowly towards us, winds uh, bands of cloud and rain around it as we head towards and into the weekend. By the end of the weekend, some more prolonged rain there, uh, courtesy of that weather front. So tomorrow then, we've got uh, a fair amount of cloud, we've got bits and pieces of rain there, especially in eastern areas, and uh, as I say, a more noticeable southeasterly breeze. By the time we get to Friday, we're into a more showery picture. Yeah, there'll be a few showers around, most of us will catch uh, the odd shower, but there will be some brightness in between those showers. Temperatures again, 12 or 13 Celsius at best in a southeasterly breeze. It's a similar picture for Saturday. By Sunday though, the rain is becoming more widespread. Temperatures continue to make it into the low teens by day and we should stay just about frost free overnight. Jeff? Is that the best you can do? We'll just be about. frost free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's it from us. Thanks for watching. Back same time tomorrow. Hope you can join us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.